Amen. Awesome. Thanks, worship team. We're going to jump into the Word this morning. We are in a season of rest uh, as a church. That's our theme uh, for this month in our Kingdom Legacy uh, series, or uh, we're going to be focusing on rest. And um, if this is your first time here, let me just give you a quick uh, catch up. If this isn't your first time here and you've been here every week, uh, that's okay. Repetition is the master of learning. So, uh, so let, let's do a quick recap. First thing you need to understand is that in an Australian mindset, we think rest is, is chilling out and putting our feet up. Uh, but when the Bible talks about rest, what it's actually talking about is empowerment. It's talking about that God's empowerment to bring you into all of His promise. And there's, there's a couple of signifiers um, of God's uh, rest, and that is His presence, His uh, protection, and His provision. There's more than that, but they're, they're the three real big ones. And God, once Adam lost the rest of the Garden of Eden, has always tried to get rest back to His people. He tried to do that through the nation of Israel. Uh, the first generation didn't quite get it. They, they spent the rest of their lives in the wilderness. The second generation was able to go in through Joshua, uh, which is also a picture of Jesus and salvation. It's also, last week, we looked at how that's also a picture of when our Yeshua, salvation, Jesus himself returns in the book of Revelation. It's a similar pattern uh, to the battle of Jericho where he ushers in our day of rest uh, in the millennial reign. Uh, but there also the kingdom has been inaugurated by Jesus. Now, he said this, he said, um, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And, and so it's actually through Jesus that the kingdom has been inaugurated. It's, it's yet to be fully fulfilled in all and through all in a physical, literal sense. That's, that's yet to happen. But, but there is certainly an inauguration of the kingdom that has already happened through Jesus. Uh, now, you get three Christians in the room and you'll probably have four different theologies. Um, but there is one thing that every theologian, right from Catholicism all the way through uh, to, you know, raging Pentecostals over here on the, on the right, um, it, it, everyone is in agreement that the main message Jesus came preaching was the kingdom of God. Nobody's in disagreement about that. There is not a theologian in Christendom that says, oh, no, I think Jesus was talking about something different. No, 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 no. Everybody in agreement. Now, that's a miracle in itself that everyone in Christianity is in agreement. But everyone is in agreement. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and that's what we preach. We preach the establishment of God's kingdom here on earth. That's been his heart through what, what, what was lost through Eden. Jesus is restoring uh, as the second Adam. And Romans goes through that uh, in quite a lot of detail. Um, but in Hebrews, Paul, well, I believe the author of Hebrews is Paul, but maybe somebody else. Now, we're not entirely sure, but the writer of Hebrews says that this in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, which is his presence, his protection, his provision, let us fear not, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. That's speaking about Israel not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Speaking about the first generation of, of Israelites walking in the wilderness. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, when did God establish his rest for your life? Even before the foundation of the world was laid. God had designed a rest for you to live in. What's the natural environment of humanity? It's the seventh day rest. Humanity was made on the sixth day, but he lives in the seventh day. So the natural environment of humanity is the seventh day rest, which God prepared for all of humanity before the foundations of the world were even laid. Now, we, we start a new day at 12.01 a.m. In Jewish people, the Hebrews, they start a new day at sunset. So Adam was made on the sixth day and at sunset he entered into rest, the seventh day rest. That was his first day. The first day of humanity was the seventh day rest. You drop down to verse 9 in chapter 4. It says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Are you the people of God? You have a rest that God has provided for you. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. 
And so we've gone through various pictures that God used to illustrate this. First of all, the Sabbath day, that you would work six days and God would provide twice as much manna on the sixth day, a double portion of manna on the sixth day, so you could rest on the seventh. Then there was a Sabbath year and God would provide a double harvest in the sixth year so that you could then take the whole seventh year off. Uh, Then there was the Jubilee year, which God would then in the 49th year, sorry, the 48th year provide a a three-year surplus. So in the 49th year you would rest, in the 50th year you would rest. Also all lands went back to the original owners, all debts were forgiven, all slaves were set free. And when Jesus turns up in Luke 4.18, reading the prophet Isaiah, uh, he says that the acceptable year of the Lord is part of his declaration. That was code for saying the year of Jubilee. Jesus has turned up and said, I'm your rest, I'm your provision, all slaves are free, all land has been returned to its original owners and the original inheritors, and I am here to provide you rest. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in him, we live, we move and have our being. That It's in Him that all of our provision and healing comes. It's in Him that our protection is already provided for us. Sometimes people like to say that Christianity is that we are saved by Jesus. It's a gospel of salvation. Gospel of salvation. We're saved by Jesus. Then we've got to journey through this rotten, stinking, cursed world. And then one day, someday, when we get to heaven, that's when will experience the promises of God. Uh, That's just not the way the Bible depicts rest. Uh, It says, no, we've already entered in to rest in Christ Jesus, that the kingdom has already been inaugurated. Jesus came saying that the kingdom of God is here, is at hand, is now. And, and, And now that we've entered into that rest, we've entered into that rest, that we already step into His kingdom. And from the provision, protection and healing that He's already brought to us, then we overflow and multiply it and bring to fruition into the rest of the world. Just like Adam was asked. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden and he said, okay, now multiply. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Don't confuse the two. The gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom are two different gospels. And you can limit and isolate the gospel of the kingdom by isolating it to the gospel of salvation. It's an important aspect of the gospel, but it's not the fullness of what Jesus preached. So I'm going to tie it all together now. And, uh, and this has been quite a teaching series. We've gone deep in some, you know, some, some fairly heavy thoughts and some doctrines. We've done a lot of Bible. There's been a lot of verses. Uh, Jethro, who, who does all the slides up um, for you to read, he said, he said, I was much much happier with the amount of Scripture you put in this morning. There wasn't as much work for him to do this morning. So it's been a, been a bit of a teaching series, but today I'm going to bring it together uh, and, and we're going to just highlight a couple of practical ways of everything that we've journeyed through. And to do that, I want to, I want to start in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to see where Peter... I was actually called to join the ministry. So let's have, let's have a look at Luke chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to pull out some principles of the kingdom, kingdom rest from this story. In verse 1 it says this, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into the boat which, which was Simon's, and asked him to put it out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, who was called Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, I've toiled all night. Toiling is part of the curse. In the Garden of Eden, Adam had perfect provision. But part of the curse or the consequence that God gave He gave several consequences, one to the serpent, some to the woman, some to the man. The consequence that he gave to Adam, he said, from now on you're going to labor, toil and sweat the ground for your provision. Anybody laboring, toiling and sweating? Anyone got a hard graph during the week? It's just the natural, it's the global economy, it's the economy which you live in. That's just the way the world works now. The world wasn't always like that. The provision came through Jesus Christ. So he says, I've been toiling all night. Um, and caught nothing. I've been toiling all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they'd done this, they'd caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. 
For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. The first thing I need you to understand and pick up from this is that this whole thing story is the calling of Peter. The whole story is, is Jesus saying to Peter, I've got a mission for you. But notice what he does before he introduces the mission to Peter. He gives him provision. He shows him that provision comes from heaven first. God's not going to give you a mission without giving you the provision. God's not like, okay, establish the kingdom of God. Oh, by the way, you guys need to fund it. He's not, I need you to go out and I need you to eradicate poverty. Oh, by the way, you better go to work to do that. We got a work, labor, toil and sweat mentality. Peter, when when Jesus was saying, let down your nets, he was thinking, I've already toiled. I've already worked. I've already labored. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he said, okay, there's there's 5,000, probably closer to 12,000 people here. And he says to the disciples, you feed them. What did they say? Well, that's going to take a year's wages. They thought toil. They didn't think heaven's provision. Jesus is trying to teach them, no, it's not about labor, toil, and sweat anymore. It's about the provision of the kingdom of God. That that the very first thing, when, when you come into an understanding of the laws of the kingdom, is that they operate completely different to the laws of this world. The laws of this world operate under the consequences of eradicating God and removing God from his rightful place, which then brings death and separation and poverty These are all spiritual terms. Poverty is a spiritual term, not a financial term. Whereas the kingdom of God, not only does it bring life back into you individually, but also into economies, into nations, and into communities, into marriages, and into households. Wholeness, prosperity, restoration, these are spiritual terms. You didn't see brokenness, you didn't see divorce, you didn't see poverty before the curse. And whatever came through Adam... Jesus reversed at the cross. He reversed the curse at the cross so that we could once again live in the kingdom of God as sons and daughters of God. Adam was referred to as the son of God. You go back to the genealogy in Matthew, it goes all the way back. Sorry, Matthew, um, Matthew outlines the Davidic genealogy. You go back in the genealogy of, in Luke of Christ's birth, it goes all the way back to, uh, to Adam. It says, Adam, son of God. Adam was the son of God. Now Jesus has made a way for us to be son of God. Therefore, we have also now also gone into his provision, his protection, and his presence. There are other things, but I just want to focus on those three things right now. Here's the other thing. You can tell Jesus is trying to teach them something different. It's a new way of thinking. And I know some of us, even me, my journey, I had to, I had to think differently when it came around this. I was 29, raised in the church, completely broke, $150,000 in debt. Raised in the church. But it was only when I stopped thinking with worldly wisdom and started thinking in the laws of the kingdom that I was able to actually get rid of that labor, toil and sweat and get out of debt. And and now, uh, you know, I do live with the supernatural provision of God. Time and time again, I could tell you story after story or or already shared a few with you. And and right now, there will still be some, and I was one of them, that would sit there and be like, no, that just doesn't make sense. And Peter's one of those guys because Jesus said, I need you to let down your nets And so Peter let down a net, one, singular. God's always thinking bigger than you. God's always got more than what your mind can conceive. Jesus is saying, let down your nets. And Peter's like, man, I've toiled all night, all right, I'll give you a single net. Well, that was a mistake. Because the net started to break because of how big God thinks. Your worldly containers will never be able to handle the heavenly provision and blessing that God has in store for you. But what does that look like on a Monday? What does that look like when you're running a business, when, you, when you're actually operating a business in a, in a global economy? What does that look like? Well, let me, let me give you some practical steps in this. For starters, as Christians, we can't have a mailbox mentality. What do I mean by that? As in, well, um, you know, uh, the check's going to, you know, God's going to send me a check in the mail. That's a mailbox mentality. What did, what did Jesus do? Did he, like, did, he like, did he raise his hand and then just make a whole bunch of fish jump into the boat? No, that, that would be a mailbox. He could have done that. I, I mean, it's, 
It's not, it's not out of his power, out of his way, or, you know, like it wasn't like he didn't get like this string, string orchestra over here to play some music. He didn't get the keys player to come up and set some good spiritual atmosphere and, you know, set the mood and, and get the church choir back. And then he's like, you know, raises the fish and places them in the boat. Like that would have been cool. And you and I probably would have thought like that, right? But no, what did Jesus do? He's like, no, you lower your nets. Jesus always walks, works in partnership. It, it, it's, it's astonishing that God wants to partner with us, but that's just the, what he's chosen. He's chosen to partner with you. So, so what are your nets? There is a provision there for you. There is a supernatural provision for your mission, but what is your net and what is Jesus asking you to lower? The Bible's more practical and more physical than often what we actually give, give it credit for. We like to over-spiritualize things all the time. What's, God, what's your net? You might be really good with numbers. You might be uh, really good at academic study. You might be really good at science. You might be really good uh, in, in human interaction and interpersonal skills. And You, just might, you might have a gift of, 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 of salesman. You might be the best salesman in your business. You might be, have the ability to start a business. You might have the ability to cook. Now, that is a gift. Hallelujah. My favorite congregant, Savvy, cooked me a curry this week. Blessing, blessing, and she is my favorite congregant. I, I have favorites. God doesn't, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm still trying to be like Jesus. You know? But then, what, what's what's your net? What, what's God given you? What's in your hand? Because what's in your hand is of, is often what God wants to use to bring that supernatural provision. Stop having a mailbox mentality that somebody's going to come and just give you a check, that somebody's going to come and just pay off your house, or somebody's going to come and just give you a car. Now that happens. Don't get me wrong. That happens. But the way, the modus operandi that God in the kingdom of God operates is he set up the laws of the kingdom and he says, okay, son, okay, daughter, now you go. This is why prosperity and stewardship go hand in hand. You can't have prosperity without stewardship. You can't be like, God bless me and yet not tithe. Not as much agreement on that one. You, you, you can't be like, I want, I want to live in the abundant and the blessings and the prosperity of the land and yet not write a budget. You've got more money than what you think you do. You might just need to actually write it down, budget it, actually steward it well, and you'll see, oh, actually, I was more prosperous than I thought. Which, coincidentally, we're doing. In November, you can still register for we are doing budgeting classes. We, we want to put practical skills in your hand. The Word of God is more practical than what we realize. And so if that's an area of stretch for you, we would love to... And don't be embarrassed by that. Uh, you'd be surprised how, many, how few people actually budget. Maybe nobody's ever shown you. Maybe your, your parents never showed you how to budget, how to write a budget, how to balance the books. And it's easy these days because you don't even need a credit card. You just wave your phone everywhere. You just wave your phone here, wave your phone there, you pay for this, you pay for that. And, and then you, 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 know, you look at the, oh, I've got negative $36 in my account. I don't know how that happened. Well, okay, let's set a budget. School won't teach you how to budget. There's no class at school to teach you how to budget. So that's okay. We'll do it. Because God has got a supernatural provision for you because he's got a supernatural mission for you. It's kingdom provision for a kingdom mission. That, that's why. And, and, and this is why God's got a lot to say about money because he wants his, he wants his sons and his daughters, he wants his family prospering. Yes, amen. I know that, that, that's, that's sometimes news to Christians. And, and I've touched on this several times because we somehow throughout church history got an idea that poverty was holy. Poverty is a curse. There ain't nothing holy about it. It devastates and ravishes communities and nations. Where it ever got into the Christian psyche that poverty was a blessing and, and some sort of um, attrib attribution to our righteousness and holiness is just nonsensical to me. It, it, it's completely, and I believe the source is in, the, in a Gnostic theology that says everything spiritual is holy and everything natural is, is, is unholy and therefore money must be unholy. No, no, no. The love of money and mammon, putting it first and seeking that instead of seeking the kingdom of God... That's, you, you seek mammon, you love it, you chase it, that's, that's what you make your goal and your objection for. Yeah, that's going to lead to destruction, no doubt, because no amount of money is going to satisfy that greed. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. 
God wants you blessed. God wants you prospering. Why? Because he's got a mission for you. He wants you blessed because he wants your neighbor blessed. That's why. But if your neighbor's naked, if your neighbor's hungry, if your, na- if your neighbor is in need and you have no supernatural provision of God to fulfill that mission, then we've missed it. What are your nets? The second thing is, where, where is your trust? Giving comes down to trust. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a trust transaction on a, on a Sunday morning. When we talk about giving, and we just worship God with our giving, it's a trust transaction. Let's have a look at this in, in, a, in a broader sense. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to, we're going to read a fair big chunk of Scripture, but we're going to go through it bit by bit. Because here God... Uh, is talking through Moses. The Deutero means second, so there's a second recollection of everything that happened from uh, from Genesis through to Numbers, um, and and here is the second telling of essentially Moses uh, giving what's uh, what what happened in Israel's history up to this point. And he says this in verse six. He says uh, th- this whole chapter, chapter eight, by the way, is about remembering God. It's about remembering God and what he's already done in your life. This is something that we really need to be good at, even as Christians. We need to remember the faithfulness and the awesomeness of our God and what he saved us from, because it makes tomorrow look so much better. When you are constantly recollecting all of the goodness of God in your life, then it doesn't matter what storm is on the horizon, because you know the glory of your yesterday. You serve a faithful God who has never let you down. And, and this is part of what Moses is saying here to the people. He said, Just let's, let's remember God. And he says in verse 6 here, he says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and of springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, God's calling you into a land of blessing. I often say to people who criticize, you know, our oh, prosperity is not part of the Christian gospel. I'm like, well, if prosperity is not part of the Christian gospel, I'm becoming Jewish because it's certainly part of theirs. Their God wants them blessed. Their God is constantly calling them into a blessing, constantly calling them into a land where he's like, I'm going to give you guys uh, olive oil, uh, a, a wine, I'm going to give you pomegranates. And we go to Israel, one of my favorite things to do when you're in Israel, these vendors are everywhere in Israel, is they, they just get a big bag of, of pomegranates just sitting there and they got like these, they look like medieval kind of torture chambers really, the little miniature medieval torture. They get the pomegranate, they just squeeze it and out comes straight pomegranate juice and it is the most refreshing tasty beautiful drink you had just straight pomegranate juice and uh and I, it's just it's beautiful this is this is what god prepares for his people is beautiful food and produce matter of fact that is my i know it's like the holy land and like jesus walks there and it's like land of miracles but i mean i just love the food in israel I know that's really carnal of me. I know, like, the Lord's still working on, on my spiritual formation. But, man, when I'm jumping on that plane to go to Israel, I'm like, thank you, Lord, for that buffet. <laughs> like, it is, it is um, uh, immense, and it truly is. And you know what? That's actually, that, that actually, in and, of, in and of itself, is an evidence of God, an evidence of fulfilled Bible, because you go back 100 years, that whole land was swamplands, it was desert, it was barren, there was, no, there was no produce there, it was absolutely unwanted land. Uh, but now, uh, Israel is the third largest exporter of Europe's fruit. Third largest exporter of Europe's fruit comes from this once barren, desert, swampy land that nobody wanted. And I believe you turn to the prophet Isaiah and he says that the desert will bloom again. Well, that's happened in our, in our lifetime. Israel is an amazing place of produce. As a matter of fact, they even export water. Do you know they export water? They export water to Jordan. Uh, they export water to, uh, to, the, to their neighboring Palestine. Um, but they, 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 Israel, the desert, exports water. as fulfilled Bible prophecy. Where was I? I got sidetracked with pomegranates, didn't I? As soon as I start talking about food, it happens every time. 
a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. Oh, my dear Lord Jesus, ain't that the truth? When you go, sorry, one more story, one more story, one more story. When you go to Israel, the bread is not, it, it is without scarcity. There is bread everywhere and beautiful breads. And I'm telling you, you have not had hummus until you go to Israel. The hummus in Israel is, oh my goodness, the keys player is back. I've got to get off food. All right. <laughs> You'll lack nothing. A land whose stones and iron are out of whose hills you can dig copper. Once again, what did, what did God say? I've put copper in the land, but that's okay. I, I'm going to get it out for you. No, no. I've provided supernatural provision in this land. You better get your shovel out, start digging. We're not, we're not having a mailbox mentality. The people of God, we work hard and we're blessed. We're diligent, faithful servants. Yeah, we're blessed. I'll preach that till I'm blue in the face. We're blessed. But I tell you what, we partner with God in our diligence, in our faithful service to the King. And He partners with us. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God, the good of the land which He has given you. Listen to the warning here, though. This is really what I want you to understand, is, is how this turns a little bit. Because he says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, His statutes, which I command you today, lest, listen to this, when you have eaten in a full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. In other words, when you're living in the land of promise, you're living in the land of prosperity, you're living in the fullness of everything that God has given you, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of this land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which the fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water and who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not even know. In other words, manna, manna didn't even exist. It was a supernatural provision that he might humble you, that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gained me this wealth. That's what we've got to be careful of, particularly as Christians in the West. Because, now I'm going to make a big statement here. I haven't got time to unpack that for you. But really, uh, where you see the gospel preached the most is where you will see the nations with the greatest liberties, the greatest freedoms, the greatest equalities, the greatest care for their society. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, doesn't only bring blessing to the individual, but it also to the nation. And so in the Christian West, we are prosperous, mostly because our nations were built on very kingdom principles like rule of law, uh, common law, even, uh, even uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself is actually the foundation of all tort law. Tort law is, is basically um, where you can sue one another if you've been done wrong, right? That, that's, that there, a civil just society was built on a kingdom principle. So where you see that, equality between men and women, it, this is all a result of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, like I said, a big statement. I'll, I'll have to probably spend half an hour to actually trace that through for you. But, but, but here's the thing. Out of our freedom and our blessing, which was provided by God, we're in danger of forgetting actually where it came from. And we can start to look inwardly and be like, well, I built this. I got this. This is my education. This was my hard work. I'm the source of my own blessing. My hands is what pays the bills around here. And then all of a sudden, that then leads to you withholding the tithe, withholding the offering. Why? Because it's actually you that provides, not God. And, and, and what that ends up happening is it, just, it, it, just, it never leads to life. It never leads to life. But he, he, Moses is giving a clear warning. He's saying, like, when you're in the land of blessing, just remember that you actually came from bondage. When you're in the land of prosperity, just remember that you were actually saved from poverty. When you're, when you're eating your pomegranate juice or drinking your pomegranate juice and eating your hummus, just remember that you used to have nothing to eat. When you're living in your freedom, just remember the slavery that I saved you from. And some of us, like, I've got to be careful of this because I was raised in the church. I haven't really felt the sting of the world like others have. And so I've got to be careful of this. 
But some of us, maybe you have experienced what it is like to live in the brokenness of this world. And God came in and saved you and redeemed you and restored you and brought your marriage back together and brought your kids back from the brink of drug addiction. And maybe you know what this is like exactly. But I want you to understand it's important that we all remember that part of living in the rest of the kingdom is acknowledging that there's a king in the kingdom. And He's the source. He's the provider. He's the protector. Let me give you an example, a real practical example. One of the things that Jesus asked Peter to do is launch out into the deep. And so there's three different situations or positions that you can have in this story. There's a multitude sitting on the banks. The, the multitude are hearing Jesus teach. The multitude are listening to his message, but they're sitting on the banks. But then you got, you got the disciples, you got uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're also, they're partners with Simon. They're, they're cleaning the nets. They're, they're closer to Jesus. They're doing the work. They're, they're here. They're at church. They're in the car park, parking cars. They're, they're, they're in the cafe right now getting our morning tea ready. And they're down in kids making sure that they're getting taught the word of God so we can sit here. You know, the, the, these guys, they're washing their nets, and that's all good. We love our volunteers. We love our team. We love those. They, they, this, and it's for the multitudes. We're here to serve people. We are here to serve people. That's what we're We're not here to dominate, but we're here to serve people. And so that, that we need the multitude, but we also need the workers. But there, there's a level, I believe, that God's inviting everyone into, but not everyone goes to, and that is to launch out into the deep. Peter says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, I, I want you to launch out into the deep, and let down your nets. Uh, this is an invitation of intimacy that God has always brought us into. That we actually have an invitation to launch out into the deep with God. Peter experienced another deep situation with Jesus. This time it was in the midst of a storm. And, and Jesus was actually walking on the water uh, and going past the boat. He was just going to keep on walking uh, straight on by them. And, uh, and they all... The disciples all freaked out because they thought it was a ghost. And, and, and Peter wanted to test this situation. He's like, uh, Jesus, if it is actually you and not a ghost, bid me come. In other words, bid me to step out of the boat. And Jesus, he said, yeah, come on. Come for a walk. It's a great night. And so Peter steps out of the boat. And, and, and while he's focused on Jesus, while he's focused on the king, while he's focused on the man that protects and provides when he's focused on the presence of Jesus, he is walking on that water. But then he starts to look at the wind. He starts to look at the waves. And he starts to look at the deep situation that he's about to sink in. And as soon as he shifts his focus from the king of the kingdom, then his situation starts to walk on him instead of him walking on his situation. It's in the deep storms of life that we need to look to our deep hope in Christ. It's in that moment there. It's in the deep storms of life. That there, that's the moment that we need to turn to our deep hope in Christ. When there's a brokenness on the horizon, when there is destruction, when there are credit cards that we can't pay, when there is children that we can't seem to lead, when, when there is business deals that we can't seem to close, when there is uh, just a, a, a darkness that comes over our soul that we just can't seem to shake, it's in those deep storms of life. That there, that's the moment that we need to look to our deep hope in Christ. But if you never accept the invitation that Jesus gave Peter, launch out into the deep, that by the time you come to the deep storms of life, you're still sitting on the bank and you've got nothing to recall. You've got nothing to stand on, none of that hope. So that's why right now, now's the time that we build our intimacy with Christ. Now's the time that we learn. I'm going to trust you with everything, God. I'm going to trust you with my marriage. I'm going to trust you with my business. I'm going to trust you with my career. I'm going to trust you with that ache in my heart that I can't seem to shake. I'm going to trust you with my health. I'm going to trust you with my safety and my security. And even when the storm comes, 
we still hold fast and focus on that deep hope in Christ. Because hope does not disappoint. Hope in Jesus will never disappoint. And so I guess if we were to sum up this whole series, this is what it looks like in the life of the believer. Because we've entered into rest, and rest, it's hard paradox to wrap our minds around because the only thing we have to work at in Christianity is resting in Christ. It kind of doesn't make sense, does it? The thing we need to work the most at is resting. You need to work at rest. Have I lost anyone? But let me say it a little bit simpler. It's not about how much you love God. It's actually about how much of you God's love has. Have you let God's love infiltrate every area of your life? Are there parts that you're saying, Lord, don't go there, that's too deep. Lord, you... Uh, you're my saviour, absolutely, but I, I can't let you access that part of my life. It, uh, it, it's too deep. It's too deep. You don't have access to that. It's going to hold back the rest that you've been invited into. I can't let you go there, Jesus. I can't let my hopes be built up again. I can't let my faith be built up. I can't stand the disappointment, God. So I just, I can't have you in there. It's too deep. And Jesus is saying, let me in. Let me saturate that. Let me calm And bring my presence, my provision, my protection into every area of your life. Because it's not about how much you love God. The Israelites, they they loved God. It's just they didn't mix it with their faith and just let God's love have them. 